announcement to us from Sister Gabrielle. And I'll read this to you, and it will be posted on the back as well on the board. It says, to thank you for your kindness and sympathy at a time when it was deeply appreciated. We are just so touched by all the love you have shown. The cards, the flowers, the constant prayer. You've been a source of comfort and care. Love, Gabrielle, Tyler, and Tiana. We loved, loved our brother much, and we know that they miss him. We also want to announce that our fifth Sunday, next Sunday, July 31st, instead of our usual sermon study, we will have a congregational meeting at which time we'll put forth names of men for your consideration as additional elders and deacons. During the following four weeks, members will have opportunity to reach out to these men with any questions they might have. We then hope to appoint men on Sunday, August 28th, if we can stay on schedule, but that's the plan right now. Uh, uh, preaching next Sunday, July 31st, is our brother Bryce Roth. He'll be preaching for us next Sunday. Uh, our Bible Basics Lecture Series, there are flyers on the table at the back. Uh, please try to invite others. It's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, August 11th, 12th, and 13th at 7 p.m. Uh, speakers will be Jason Longstreth and Miles Hester. We hope to have some Spanish speakers to reach out to that Miles will be addressing with the same lessons, I believe. They're planning that for us, and the topics are on the flyer as well. Uh, that's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, August 11th, 12th, and 13th at 7 p.m. Class teachers to rotate. We changed it just a little bit. Sunday, August 21st, teachers in the Young People's Bible classes will rotate. Sign-up sheet is on the board. Some classes have already been signed for. Uh, we are switching to trimesters with our singing nights and uh, other things that come up. It's, we're going to try that. It seems too short to get all of these uh, units in sometimes when we do it in just three months. So this trimester starts a little early when the college students come back. August 21st will end at the end of December. Uh, the second one, January through April. And then the third trimester, May 1st to August 31st. Our unit of study in the high school and middle school class, college class and adult class, will be Faith in Action Studies in James. Uh, there'll be some books to help guide us through the book of James that will be, uh, that will be here by the time we start that class. Um, oh, and I do need to get with, but I'll talk to them, teachers of the elementary and pre-K class to determine what their next unit of study will be. I believe the pre-K has already started one that we'll probably stay with, but we'll talk to those teachers. Uh, we do welcome any visitors that we have. I don't think we have any today. We had a lot last week, but this week we don't have any visitors. If, if you are visiting, please fill out a card for us from the pew in front of you and place that in the plate or hand it to someone. We'd like to thank you for your visit. Our prayer list, Linda, bon, Linda Donovan's sister Judy is doing better, at last I heard, and her daughter-in-law Kathy also doing better. Pray for Car Carla Haskins' friend Joyce, suffered severe injuries from a fall from a horse. Bonnie Holt has COVID and the family is isolating today. Uh, Shirley Moore, good, good to see her. She's here almost every Sunday she can be, struggles with lupus and other health issues. Uh, Maggie Myers, one of our college students with, with lupus. Beth Roth, issues concerning, concerning her heart, being treated with medication for now. Please keep Beth in your prayers. Uh, Barbara Ree, it was good to see her last week. She hadn't been here in a lot of weeks and she was expressing to me uh, and she called yesterday how Glad she was to be here. Wasn't going to be able to be here today. Was not feeling real good. I do have to make a correction, and I get lots of calls where I need to make corrections. She will not be having a procedure on August 16th. She thinks she might be able to avoid that, so we're, let's pray that that happens. She wasn't really wanting to do that anyway. Uh, George's grandfather had the aneurysm. He had gone back home, but then back to the hospital. Is still in the hospital and not well. And, uh, here and there, okay. But let's keep praying for George's grandfather. He is back in the hospital. Uh, Al Walker, he had been exposed to COVID at work last Wednesday. He wasn't here isolating. He does seem to be symptomatic now. He is isolating at home, so let's pray for Brother Al. And Garrett Walker, as we know, has called me and, and told me he has tested positive for COVID. He's dealing with several symptoms and requests prayers on his behalf. So let's pray for Brother Garrett. We continue our prayers for Bud Stanley for Frony, she cares for him. For Sister Taylor and Charlotte, she cares for her. We have travelers, Jan is vacationing in Rome. 
Uh, the Andersons will be leaving soon. They'll be gone for a couple weeks, about from the end of July through about August 14th, to meet their new grandson. And we know the Longstrus are traveling to Madeira Beach this week, but they plan to be with us on Wednesday. Our college students are away, but they'll be returning in about three or four weeks, so we look forward to welcoming, welcoming them back. Our order of service this morning. David Gerald will have the scripture reading, and that will be in Job chapter 42, verses 1 to 6. If I wrote that down correctly, Job 42, 1 to 6. Lead singing, Bryce Roth. The first song is posted, and it's in the supplement. He has a system, as most do now. If it's on the left, it's in the supplement, and if it's in the right on the board, it's in the regular book. Our first prayer will be Chuck Hester. I will lead the Lord's table, assisted by Josiah Jones, Kyle Anderson, and Miles Hester. Jason Longstreth will be preaching, and the closing prayer will be worded by Larry Stover. We'll begin our worship period now with the scripture reading. Good morning. <clears throat> As was stated, we we're going to be reading in Job chapter 42 verses 1 through 6, and, and what this is talking about is Job's repentance and restoration. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is, who is, who, <clears throat> you ask this, who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. For our singing this morning, I wanted to focus on the idea of the holiness of God and how in his presence it's holy. It's holy ground. And so then also, as that we come into his presence, we're coming into his holy presence. So the first song we're going to sing is We Shall Assemble. <clears throat> Number 76, we shall assemble. To me, we shall assemble on the mountain, we shall assemble at the throne, with humble hearts into his presence, we bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the And at the end of our journey, we shall bow down on bended knee, and with the angels up in heaven, we'll sing the song of victory, glory and honor and dominion, unto the Lamb, unto the King. Sing the song of the redeemed. Our next song will be in the normal book, number 22. 
Number 22, He is in our midst. After this song, we'll have an opening word of prayer. <clears throat> he is in our midst. Do, do, so. Draw from the springs of salvation, give thanks to his great and holy name. Make known his deeds among the people, make known his exalted way. Praise the Lord and shout for joy, for the Holy One is in our midst. Praise the Lord and shout for joy, for he is in our midst. Call on his name with thanksgiving, yes, joyously praise his name in song. Through love he authored our salvation, through love he did give his son. Praise the Lord and shout for joy, for the Holy One is in our midst. Praise the Lord and shout for joy, for he is in our midst. Let's pray. Our most holy and righteous Heavenly Father, we're indeed thankful for all that we have and all the time and this place and opportunity that we have to come together and to sing songs of praise to you, to offer up this prayer, to the Bible study we just had in this hour of worship that we're entering into at this time. Father, we pray that everything we do and have done and will do is done in spirit and in truth. Father, we're mindful of all those that were mentioned and the announcements of those that are have health problems, uh, either undergoing doctor's care or, or whatever the case may be. Father, just be with them. We're also mindful of the families uh, that are members here that have lost loved ones recently and pray you continue to comfort them and be mindful of them. Father, just watch over us. Help us to be a better people. Father, we're be thankful for all that we have and that we so richly bless us. Father, we're thankful for all that, but most importantly, we're thankful for your son. And in a short while, we'll remember his great sacrifice on that cross and help us to always, as this Sunday, be no different than any other, that we remember it as we should. Father, we're mindful of all those that are maybe are not here today, not due to physical reasons, but maybe spiritual. Help us to help them in any way we can and see about their spiritual needs and pray, Father, that they have the opportunity to make their lives right before it's everlasting too late. And we're mindful of the meeting that's uh, shortly to come in just a couple of weeks here that's been prepared. And Father, be with the congregation here and help it to continue to prepare for that weekend. Help us as members to go out and mention it and talk to as many as we can about it and uh, to bring as many people here to hear your word as we can. Father, be with uh, Jason as he works with the congregation here and be with the elders, be with the congregation, the elders and deacons, and be with those um, as they try to grow uh, the number here and, and, and help us to, to do what we can as members. Father, just be with us through this hour of worship, and this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Number 111 in the supplement. Number 111, Holy Ground. And after this song, we will partake of the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Number 111, Holy Ground. <clears throat>
present and where he is is holy. You are holy God, a perfect and holy God. We will come before you with hearts made clean by Jesus' blood. You are holy God, a perfect and holy God. We will come before you with hearts made clean by Jesus' As we think about the emblems that we're just about to partake of, I'd like to read from Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to read verses 12 down through 15. Hebrews 9, 12 through 15. Now with the blood of goats and calves, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And then I'd like to also read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're here to do today, to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes to remember his going to the cross for us that we might be saved, as we just read in Hebrews. Jesus paid the price, and he did it once for all, for all mankind who would come to him in obedience. We can be so thankful for that and all the blessings we enjoy in Christ and the hope of eternal life that we have in him. Let us, Brother George, do the prayer for the bread. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity for your wisdom in establishing this, for putting this together so we can remember the price that was was paid for our salvation. Father, I ask you to be with every one of us, help us to put aside the thoughts of this world and and to remember your son who came down to live a lowly life as one of us and to bear our sins to the cross, having his body broken and beaten and put into death to pay for each and every one of us. Father, we thank you so much for your love which allowed that gift to so freely happen. It is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue in prayer of this blessed memorial, we come thanking you for this, the fruit of the vine, which represents the spilt blood of Jesus upon that cross. We know, Father, that there is nothing that we can do to be able to be worthy to be with you in heaven one day, but we know through your plan of salvation that you allowed Jesus to come to this earth and for him to go to that cross so by, through the shedding of his blood that may give us that hope of heaven someday. We pray as we partake of this that we remember the ultimate sacrifice that was given on behalf of us. And we pray, Father, that you will be with us and care for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Uh, Brother Josiah is going to give thanks before we collect the offering from the members this morning. Let's pray. Our Lord, as we take a moment to give back to help the support of this church and to further your work, we thank you for the many blessings that you provide us daily. We pray that we never forget the sacrifice of your son we never forget that you're in control of all things and that all that we enjoy down here on earth comes from you thank you in your son's name we pray amen like to mark the invitation song of this time it will be number two in the normal books number two hallelujah praise jehovah before we have the lesson we'll sing number one holy 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 number one 
Good morning. It is good to see everybody here this morning. Good to be with you once again. Uh, we still enjoy, I know, uh, as was mentioned, this is our week where we uh, go over and, and able to spend some time over at uh, Madeira Beach as a, a family. Um, still love coming back over to Forest Hills for our services. It really isn't that long of a drive. It's only about 45 minutes from where we're staying over there, but it, it's good to still be able to be together to worship God, to encourage each other. And I, I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles to the book of Job. We're going to be spending some time going through the book of Job and I actually have a little bit extra time this morning, which I'm thankful for. Sometimes it's a little bit after 11 by the time I get up to give the lesson. Uh, but we've, we've got a lot in store for us this morning. We're going to try to really survey the entire book of Job and try to bring some of the lessons out of the book of Job that we can to apply to our lives. 
And, and I know there's been a couple of occasions, I think at least twice in the years that I've been here at Forest Hills, that we've studied Job in a classroom setting. We haven't done it that often, in part because Job is such a big book. Uh, there are 42 chapters in the book of Job. It takes a long time to go through all of those speeches and all of that discourse and everything that takes place in the book of Job. And so we've been more likely on a couple of occasions as well to come back and, and try to survey the book like we're doing this morning. But I think it's important that we keep these lessons in front of us all the time. Uh, I know when we deal with Job, we're dealing with the problem of suffering and we're trying to understand why things happen the way that they happen in the world. And, and there's always reasons for us to do that. Uh, at different times in our lives, we're all dealing with different struggles, different problems. Certainly, again, over the last couple of years with the pandemic that still is not gone, uh, that's caused a lot of difficulties for individuals with illness and death and sometimes other uh, challenges that have come with that, uh, work challenges, financial challenges, other problems. But when we look at the book of Job, it really is a magnificent book. And I think it's one that we don't consider as frequently as we should. And I realize, again, when we talk about the book of Job as we begin this study, that Job is a well-known story. It's a well-known account insofar as who Job is and kind of a, at least the basics of what happened to him in his life. In fact, I think it's probably one of the best known of all of the Old Testament stories which might in some ways be a little bit surprising when we consider its background and we consider where it comes from. In the Hebrew Bible, the way that the Jews organized their scriptures, the book of Job was included in the writings, and as such, it really was not a book that they read from in the synagogue or on feast days. It really wasn't a book that was read much publicly. It was only read privately. It was kind of understood that the, the average Jew in their scriptures, if they were going to read much of Job, it was something that they did on their own. It wasn't the typical reading in the synagogue. It wasn't part of the national feast days and, and those celebrations in that way. And yet it was extremely well known, which might speak to how the topic of suffering resonates with almost everyone. By the way, I do want to mention before we get too far into this this morning as well, I'm going to read a number of passages from Job. From Job. I'm going to reference a whole lot more passages from Job that we won't take the time to read. But also when it comes time for our sermon study this morning, I've got some pretty open-ended questions there. The last one is really just what kind of personal application do you make from the book of Job? And so I want you to be thinking as we go through this study, you know, what some of these things do mean to you, how, how you would understand them, how you would put them in practice in your lives, that, that when we have this sermon study application this morning, that we really do need to try to apply this to us. But when we look at Job, I think part of the reason why it's so popular is the book really does speak to every single one of us. That we've all found ourselves on some occasions in this time of suffering, in this time of struggling to understand. And what's also maybe surprising in some way is that we don't find Job mentioned very often in other scriptures. In fact, if you look throughout the Bible, he's only mentioned a couple of times in a couple of places or a few places. We do have James chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. We're getting ready to start studying the book of James, and so we will come to that when we get to James chapter 5. But verse 10 and 11, James says, As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. And James, when he gets to talking about suffering... I mean, he does talk about suffering. He talks about endurance. He first goes to the prophets and, and says, let's think about the prophets. Let's think about all the suffering that they had gone through and what they went through as the people of God, as the spokespeople for God and how people treated them. And then he said, and also remember Job, remember the patient suffering of Job and understand that through his patience and through his endurance, that the Lord was full of compassion and was merciful. And so James gives us a little bit of a statement concerning Job, that it ends up showing the, God's compassion, it ends up showing God's mercy by the time you get to the end of it, if you endure through the entire book. And we find in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14 and verse 20, a couple of passing references to Job. 
Now again, those are very, very brief, and it just says in verse 14, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, by their own righteousness, they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord God. Down in verse 20 again, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either the son or their daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. And really not much more said about that. And there Job's just included with a couple of other examples of righteous individuals where God is saying, you know, even if these three people were in this city, I wouldn't spare the city. Even if these three people were part of it, they would only save themselves. They would not save those around them. But it doesn't have a lot of comments regarding why Job is mentioned there. And even James, again, just kind of mentions it's a sign of God's you know, faithfulness, of God's good doing when you come to the end of the book of Job. And yet even today, although it's not studied very much, we know the story of Job. I think many people, uh, certainly within the church, I think even outside the church, that they understand that story. But how well do they really understand the book of Job? Because the book of Job is more than just that short story that many people know. The book of Job is a remarkable piece of literature. It is completely unique in the Bible. It is unique in the way that we really use the term unique, how unique is supposed to be used. And unique means one of a kind. We sometimes use the word unique when we mean something is unusual. We'll say something is fairly un uh, unique. It's somewhat unique. It's kind of unique, which really doesn't make a lot of sense because unique just means one of a kind. There's nothing like it. But I would suggest to you, when it comes to the book of Job in the Bible, it is unique. There is nothing else like it. It does tell us a narrative. It gives us a historical account, as is evidenced from Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. And so it starts out giving us a little bit of that story concerning Job. There was a man you know, from the land of Uz, his name, who his name was, what he was about. And so we're going to tell you the story, the account concerning Job. But it's far more than just a narrative. It certainly does contain quite a bit of wisdom information, and it's oftentimes included in wisdom literature, but it doesn't just record wise sayings. It's different from the other books of wisdom literature, books like Proverbs, you know, that would tell us here's how we should live. Job doesn't really have that. And in fact, Job becomes problematic because depending on who said it, we're not sure that we're even supposed to listen to it or not. Is the statement valid when it appears to be some type of a wisdom statement? If Job said it, was he right in what he said? Was he wrong in what he said? If his three friends said it, were they right or were they wrong? Even when we come to the fourth human character other than his three friends and, and Job, when he speaks, we don't know if he's right or wrong in what he says. It's a poetic book for the most part, except for chapters 1 and 2 and a little bit of the beginning of chapter 32 and the end of chapter 42. The entire book is given to us in poetry. It's in poetic form. All of the speeches of the friends are in poetic form. They're written out in poetry, which might seem a bit surprising to us. But what we really find the book of Job is, is it is an epic about life. It's really telling us the struggle that we all face. Now, again, the author, as far as who penned it, is not named for us. We're not told who wrote down these words as he was guided by the Holy Spirit. We know it originates from God. All scripture comes from God. God gave us this book. God gave us this book through the Holy Spirit. But in the case of the book of Job, we don't know if Job's the one who wrote it down or if someone else wrote it down later. If some prophet was given this message by God and he recorded it for us. The setting is the patriarchal age, it appears to be, back in the times of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, in that time frame. And it's set in the land of Uz, southeast of Palestine, but none of the individuals in the book are Israelites. These are not children of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These are not the Israelites. These are not Jews or Hebrews as we would think about them in that sense. Yet it has a far-reaching appeal and found its way again into the Bible by God's giving it to us. 
It deals with a simple problem for all mankind, and it really is dealing with this problem of suffering, which is the topic for which we recognize the book. This is the story with which we are most familiar, that it's dealing with suffering, that it's dealing with problems, that it's dealing with things in Job's life. And again, those who know something about Job, they know Job was a man who started out with so many things. He had so many possessions. He was wealthy. He had all of these children. He had his sons and daughters. He was living a righteous life. And and when we're introduced to him, it just seems like everything in his life is going the way it's supposed to go. I mean, he's described to us as a righteous person. So he's doing what God wants him to do. And he's been blessed by God in the way that we might expect somebody to be blessed by God when they're doing everything that God wants them to do. And then we read in the text the challenge between Satan and God. Now, one day the angels came, the sons of God came to present themselves before God and Satan come among them. And as Satan and God are talking, of course, we could get into details. It is God, the one who first brings up Job. Have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him. You know, I mean, he fears God. He does what's commanded. He's a good person. And Satan says, yeah, God, he only does that because you give things to him. He only does that because you've built a hedge around him and you've protected him and you've made his life so good. But I tell you what, he's doing that because you've treated him so well. If you take away the good things, then he won't do what he's supposed to do anymore. You know, take away what he has, and he'll turn around and curse you. He'll disobey. And so we know that God allows Satan to do that at first. And, of course, we read in the text how he works, the work of Satan, that the oxen were taken by the Sabaeans and his servants were slain. Fire from heaven burned up the sheep and the servants. The camels were taken by the Chaldeans and the servants were slain. The house falls on his children. And it kills all of his children. His children are gathered together. And there's this catastrophe that occurs. And he loses all of his children. And so this challenge between God and Satan, you know, that Satan is allowed to take away all these things from Job. And yet Job says in chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. And so in all that series of events, that's an amazing thing that we could read right there and make applications of. You know, that here Job at this point, when he loses all of his possessions, when he loses his children, his attitude is, well, you know, I didn't have anything when I came into this world. And I won't have anything when I left. And God is God, and God can do what God wants to do. And, and, you know, praise God and serve God. And that understanding, what a great example. But that's not the end of the story. Another challenge comes from Satan. You know, you've protected his own health. What about his health? People are different when it comes to their health. We know that coming through a pandemic. You know, if you threaten them personally, physically, that will change his behavior. So take that away from him and he'll curse you. And we're told that Satan was given permission as long as he didn't kill him. Boils were given to Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. His wife tells him to curse God and die. But in Job chapter 2 and verse 10, he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And so once again, we're kind of told about Job. Job goes through this and his wife says, Now this is too much. I mean, if God's taken away all your possessions and God has taken our children away... And now God strikes you with this illness, at least from her perspective. It's time to just be done with this. Be done with God and get it over with and die. And Job says, no, no, I'm not going to do that. If God can give me good things, God can give me difficult things. Can we accept prosperity and not accept adversity from God? Now we're told he did not sin with his lips. Then his three friends arrive. And they sit with him for seven days because his pain was so great. And and yet all of that is really just the introduction. You don't really get to see the real suffering of Job, I would contend with you, until you get to chapter 3. And the real suffering comes in when Job finally starts to suffer emotionally. He, he, he has a harder time with this. You know, the suffering wasn't in losing his possessions and losing his children and losing his health. The suffering was with he's had to start mentally grappling with all that has happened. And so in chapter 3, beginning of verse 3, he says, Let the day perish on which I was to be born. 
and the night which said, A boy is conceived. May that day be darkness. Let not God above care for it, nor light shine on it. Let darkness and black gloom claim it. Let a cloud settle on it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. He curses the day of his birth. By the way, that might be a bigger deal to me. I celebrate the day of my birth a lot. You know, he says, no, let that day be darkness. Let nobody celebrate that day. What a horrible day that was when I entered into this life. He says down in verse 11, why did I not die at birth? Come forth from the womb and expire. Why did the knees receive me? Why the breast that I should suck? For now I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept then. I would have been at rest. I wish I never would have been born. I wish I would have died at birth and wouldn't have experienced all these things I've experienced. Down in verse 20. Why is light given to him who suffers and life to the bitter of soul? Who long for death but there is none. And dig for it more than for hidden treasures. Who rejoice greatly and exult when they find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden and from God uh, and whom God has hedged in? For my groaning comes at the sight of my food, and my cries pour out like water. For what I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet, and I am not at rest, but turmoil comes. And what Job's describing there is the true suffering that he's experiencing. By the way, as it relates to our class this morning, we talk about the parables, the hidden treasure. He says there's people who dig for death like that. They want to die. They don't want to experience this anymore. And he says, that's where I am. I am not at rest. I'm in turmoil. I do not have any answers. I do not understand why things are happening the way that they're happening. And that's where I think the true story of Job begins. Because he's dealing with the emotional end of the suffering. It's not what happened to him. It's how he tries to reconcile this with what he expects life to be like. You know, what happens to us isn't that big of a deal. And we sometimes talk about that. These things happen to all of us. All of us have to deal with illness. All of us have to deal with death. All of us have to deal with financial problems. All of us have to deal. The difference is how we deal with those things, how we react to those things. That's where it really becomes a challenge or doesn't become a challenge. And so when you get into Job, it's dealing with this idea of suffering. And in the body of the book, we know that we have these friends' speeches, which consume the huge portion of the book, and come in three rounds, the first round from chapters 4 through 14, where each of Job's three friends speak to him. Eliphaz is the first to speak, and generally considered to be the oldest. He seems to imply at first that he was hesitant to speak, but he can hold his tongue no longer. And so in chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, he reminds Job of the good that Job had done. Behold, you have admonished many, and you have strengthened weak hands. Your words have helped the tottering to stand, and you have strengthened feeble knees. And Elphaz tells Job, you know, in the past, Job, you've been such a good help to other people. There's been so many times that you've given good advice, and you've helped those who are struggling, and you've guided those who are in pain and suffering maybe the way that you are. But Eliphaz says, now you've failed. And he gets to the heart of the matter in chapter 4, verse 7. Eliphaz says that Job's sufferings have come upon him because he has sinned. He even claims to have seen a vision in verses 12 through 15. And he urges Job to repent. And again, we don't have time for all of those passages this morning. But he talks about God's discipline in chapter 5, verse 17. And he says that God will remove the pain, but Job has to turn back. And so Eliphaz's basic message to Job is, this has come because of your sin. I'm going to try to help you the way you've helped other people in the past. And clearly when you're going through this much suffering, Job, you you must have done something wrong. I, I know you've done something wrong. And he even says in Job chapter 5, verse 27, Behold this, we have investigated it, and so it is. Hear it and know for yourself that that clearly this is because of sin. And, And we know what we're talking about when we come to you, Job, and say this is because of your sin. And if you repent and you return back to God, then it's going to be okay. But of course, Job hadn't sinned to bring this upon himself. And Job answers this charge by saying it was his suffering that made him speak rashly in chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. And so he'll say a little bit more. 
but he maintains his claim of innocence. In chapter 6, verse 4, God has punished him, but there really was no reason to punish him. In chapter 6, verse 9, that he longed for death, but in chapter 6, verse 10, that he did not deny God. And so Job goes on to criticize his friends because his friends were not acting friendly, he says in verse 14 of chapter 6. You're not being good friends to me. Now you've come, and now you're starting to accuse me of doing things. I, I didn't ask anything of you, but I should have expected your support. And all you've done is accuse me. And so he asks them in chapter 6, verse 24, to prove their point. Prove what I've done wrong. Bring forth the charges and accusations against me. And then in his torment, in the seventh chapter, he does even lash out against God. He says in chapter 7, verse 12, that God is guarding him, but he really wants to be left alone. That God keeps harassing him, he says in chapter 7, verses 17 through 19. And then when he comes in verse 20 of chapter 7, Job says, have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I'm a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me, but I will not be. And so he says, have I done something, God, against you? I mean, he doesn't know of anything that he's done. But he also says, you know, if I have, then, then why not just forgive me of that? But why have you set me up as your target, God? Why are you using me in this way? Why are you abusing me in this way? And that was Job's answer to Eliphaz. Bildad, the second friend, then lashes out at Job. He's actually not as nice as Eliphaz was. He claims to be defending God's justice in chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. And again, he says suffering comes because of sin. And then he does something really neat in verse 4. He reminds Job, remember your children. Remember, your children. God killed your children. Why does God kill people? Because of sin. And your children died. And so, Job, that's telling you something about your family. He uses man's wisdom to support his claim. And then he concludes in chapter 8, verse 20. Lo, God will not reject a man of integrity, nor will he support the evildoers. And so, Bildad comes back and he says, look, God doesn't reject people of integrity. And he doesn't uphold evildoers. And so you, as one who's been rejected, you must not be a man of integrity. You must be an evildoer. That's what he's saying to Job. Job responds much as before. He knows God is just, but he feels helpless before him. Job is innocent, but there's no way to make his case before God. God continues to afflict Job, and Job is discouraged in chapter 9, and he expresses that discouragement. An interesting statement is made in chapter 9, verse 33. There's no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. He says, I, I don't really have a way to make my case before God because I don't have an intermediary. I don't have an intercessor. There's no umpire between me and God that we can kind of look to here. And then he says in chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, I loathe my own life. I will give full vent to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend with me. He maintains his innocence. He longs for death. He goes on to ask God to leave him alone. He says God is picking on him. And yet there's one more speaker in this first round of speeches, Zophar. And he pretty well just explodes at Job in the 11th chapter. He condemns Job. Job is not pure. Job has done all these horrible things. Zophar praises God and paints a beautiful picture of God. He does talk about repentance in an appropriate way. When he says in verse 13 of chapter 11, If you direct your heart right and spread out your hand to him, if iniquity is in your hand, put it far away, and do not let wickedness dwell in your tents, then indeed you could lift up your face without moral defect, and you would be steadfast and not fear. Well, yeah, that's, if you did have sin in your life, what you need to do is put it away from you and look to God, and, and God will forgive you. you know, and, and God will be there for you, and you have nothing to fear that bring blessings to you. But Job responds with his longest speech thus far. He lashes out in the 12th chapter against his so-called friends who seem so wise and say, I have as much intelligence as you do. And he challenges their whole argument. And throughout three chapters, Job comes back and really says what, what they've done, what they've argued, is not the truth. 
Job says the righteous do suffer and the wicked do prosper contrary to the traditional view of his day. You're saying the wicked never prosper? Look around you. You'll see wicked prospering all the time. You say the righteous never suffer? Look around you. There are righteous who have suffered and continue to suffer. And he tells them that they're attempting to speak for God, but they don't know God's mind, that they should keep quiet in the 13th chapter. They make false arguments, he says. And then he turns his attention to God once again and says, I want to make my case before God. God knows that I am innocent. If God will do two things, he says in chapter 13, verse 20 through 22, only two things do not do to me, then I will not hide from your face. Remove your hand from me and let not the dread of you terrify me. Then call and I will answer or let me speak, then reply to me. Job's really asking God, why, God? Can you just take your hand off of me and take the fear off of me and take the pain off of me? And then let's talk about this. You know, let's, let's have a conversation as to why this is happening to me in my life. And the 14th chapter is full of woe. That's not the end of the book. The second round of speeches comes in chapters 15 through 21. And here it gets much more personal. Eliphaz lashes out once again. It says, you, order, you offer windy defenses, but you condemn yourself. You do not have more wisdom than us, than men who are older than you. We've tried to speak gently, but you won't listen. You have turned against God. Job, we know you've sinned. I mean, why do you keep insisting on your innocence? Why do you keep saying, like, you want to talk to God about this? You are a sinner. And let me restate what I know and what the elders know. He says in verse, chapter 15, verse 17 through 18, that suffering comes because of sin. And in his description of the wicked man, he takes a few jabs at Job. Chapter 15, down in verse 25, because he has stretched out his hand against God and conducts himself arrogantly against the Almighty, he rushes headlong at him with his massive shield, for he has covered his face with his fat and made his thighs heavy with flesh. He's lived in desolate cities and houses no one would inhabit, which are destined to become ruins. He will not become rich, nor will his wealth endure, and his grain will not bend down to the ground. Now I said, you've been arrogant against God, and you've lived off your riches, but God's going to take this stuff. God's taking this stuff away from you because you don't deserve it. Job responds with two chapters criticizes his friends once again in chapter 16. I'm in pain. Says God has attacked him, but he is innocent. He gives another amazing statement in chapter 16, verses 19 through 21. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven and my advocate is on high. My friends are my scoffers. My eye weeps to God. Oh, that a man might plead with God as a man with his neighbor. I, I, I've got an advocate in heaven for me, Job says. And I wish I could, again, make this argument, plead with God like you might with your neighbor. And then Job reflects on his own suffering and pain. It says, all I have to look forward to is death. That's, that's all that's waiting me now, and I, I wish it would come. I, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to have this life be over. Bildad continues the attack with a speech that is some way shorter and more to the point. Chapter 18, he attacks Job. It says in verse 2, how long will you hunt for words? Show understanding, and then we can talk. Why are we regarded as beasts, as stupid in your eyes? O oh, you who tear yourself in your anger, for your sake is the, is the earth to be abandoned or the rock to be moved from its place? You know, here, you, you're trying to make all these arguments. You're not that important, Job. You don't know what you're talking about, Job. You need to listen to us, Job. You know, you're just wasting our time with your arguments. And the remainder of his speech is dedicated to the description of what happens to the wicked. What happens to the wicked? God punishes them. The friends originally tried to move Job to repent based on the nature and character of God. Now it's through fear that they're applying this. If you don't repent, Job, it's going to get even worse for you. If you don't repent, Job, God's going to bring more pain upon you. But of course, that argument doesn't apply to Job. He claims not only that his friends have wronged him, but so is God in the 19th chapter. And this is a man who is struggling with pain. He's lost loved ones, but he does know something. In Job chapter 19, beginning of verse 25, he says, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. My heart faints within me. He says, I know my Redeemer still lives. I know one day I will see God. 
I know I'll stand before God. And though I may not understand any of these other things, and I don't know why God's turned against me the way that he is, I'm going to... I'm going to see God one day. I believe that. At this, Zophar responds one last time. He's furious at Job's accusation. He speaks of the condition of the wicked, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, the joy of the godless momentary, he says in chapter 20, verse 5. He says, okay, Job, you said sometimes the wicked prosper, but I'm telling you the only wicked, they prosper for a short period of time, and God takes it away. Sound familiar, Job? You know, you were wealthy for a little while, but God took it away. What's that tell you? You know, you had your children for a little while, but God took them away. You had your wealth, but God took the, You know, the, the, the wicked, yeah, they have a little brief moment of prospering, but then God takes it away from them. And that's what he's done to you. And he describes what will happen to the wicked, that they'll be destroyed by God. Of course, what does that have to do with Job? Job says nothing. And he speaks in chapter 21. Listen carefully to my speech, verse 2, chapter 21. And let this be the way of your consolation. Bear with me that I might speak. Then after I've spoken, you may mock. And so he says, just, just listen to me and look at me. And he goes on to say, the, the wicked do live and become powerful. And, and they get to watch their children grow old, unlike what I've been not allowed to do. Their houses are safe. Their flocks increase. Their children skip. They sing songs and rejoice. They spend their days in prosperity. And they die quickly without prolonged illnesses. They reject God, but their calamity does not fall on them. His anger doesn't destroy them. You are speaking something that is not true. You are challenging the way God works. You will ask where my house is, but the wicked is carried to the grave and men mourn him. You cannot comfort me with false words. He says, your argument doesn't hold up. Look around you. Wicked prosper. I'm righteous and I'm suffering. And so the third round comes, and once again, more attacks. Eliphaz speaks first. God's punishment does not come, or does come because of sin. It's because of your, is it because of your reverence that he reproves you, that he enters into judgment against you? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquities without end? And he makes a number of specific accusations in the 22nd chapter before Job responds. For you have taken pledges, he says in Job 22, verse 6, of your brothers without cause, and stripped men naked. To the weary you've given no water to drink, and from the hungry you have withheld bread. But the earth belongs to the mighty man, and the honorable man dwells in it. You have sent widows away empty, and the strength of the orphans have been crushed. And so he says, you've done all these things, Job, which, of course, the Bible never says Job did. And Job will say, no, I didn't. I didn't do any of those things. I've never turned the hungry away. I've never turned the poor away. I've never taken pledges from anybody. I've never abused widows in any way. You're making all these accusations against me, and they're just not true. In Job's response, he reacts to some of those specific accusations. He knows the way I take when he has tried me. I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his path. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the command of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth before more than my necessary food. And he wants to appear before God again so that he can make his case. He says other people commit these sins, but I don't. Others have done all of these horrible things, but I haven't done these things. And it goes back and forth and the arguments from his friends. They continue to make these accusations against him. And Job continues to say, I haven't done anything wrong. And you're making these points that you really can't make. Where can wisdom be found? Where is understanding where, where can we get these things? I mean, yes, only God knows. But when Job takes up his last speech in chapters 29 through 31, he begins by chronicling his previous life. He remembers when God did all these good things for him, what his life was like. The blessings he received, the prime of his life, when his children were alive, when they respected him, when he lived a righteous life, when he helped the poor, protected the weak, and punished the wicked, and comforted the afflicted, that he expected to live to a good old age and die. That's what he thought life was going to be like. But that's not the life that he received. All that's changed. Chapter 30, he's despised by men. He's looked down upon and he's mocked. And what's worse, he's received punishment from God. He cries to God for help, but God doesn't answer. In fact, no one answers. But Job says, I'm still a man of my integrity. I'm still going to just keep doing what I know is the right thing to do. 
And, and I don't have the answer, but I'm not going to cave. I'm not going to give in. In fact, if I admitted to sin when I haven't committed any sin, that would be a sin. I mean, I can't change that position. He'd made a covenant in chapter 31. He'd kept it. He understood that if he broke it, he should be punished. But he's been true and faithful. He's cared for those under his control. He's helped the poor and the orphan. He didn't place his confidence in money. He did not worship the sun or the moon. He did not rejoice when his enemy fell. If only God would hear him. If he did anything wrong, let him be punished. But he's innocent. And that's how Job brings those words to an end. I mean, just let me make my case before God. Let me explain to God why this isn't right. Let me explain to God why this life and how I've been treated isn't the right way to do it. That's what Job wants to be able to do. But a powerful ending to the book remains. Because there is one more man who speaks, the man named Elihu, or Elihu. Chapters 32 through 37. He's an interesting character. We don't have time to talk about all of that related to him. I've sometimes done a separate lesson on him. But there's a lot that he says that's good. He was younger than Job's companions, and so he waited to speak until the end. But he says, I can't wait any longer. I need to say something. And so he criticizes the three friends because they've accused Job without any evidence. (laughs) He he says, you guys are saying Job has sinned. Where is the evidence that Job has sinned? I mean, you're just making an accusation that seems to fit what you think happened, but you don't know what he's done. And so their argument is false. But he also criticizes Job, not accusing Job of sinning and therefore being punished, but saying that in his suffering, Job may now be sinning. That his suffering may have made him self-righteous and proud. And that God is so powerful and majestic that no man has a right to question him. I'm not saying you sinned and brought this upon yourself, Job, but I'm saying for you to say right now that I want to talk to God and explain what he's doing and in some way suggest that God's doing you wrong right now, you can't say that to God. God doesn't do wrong. And so you can't make that kind of accusation. He does seem to be the closest to the truth in what he says. And he serves as an introduction to God finally appearing in chapter 38 out of the whirlwind. And Job finally gets his wish to speak with God, but it doesn't go the way Job wanted it to go. In essence, the Lord bombards Job with 70 questions in rapid-fire procession. Where were you? How would you? What's the answer to this? What would you do with this? How would you explain this? You tell me this. Over and over and over again, God says, okay, gird up your loins like a man. You wanted to talk to me. Let's talk. You want to question the way that I run the universe, you give me the answers to all of these things. And he just nails Job over and over and over again. Explain how this whole thing's supposed to work. You've got all wisdom and all knowledge and all understanding. If the way that I'm running the universe isn't right, you explain to me how the universe should be run. And so when he asks Job all of these things, it's all inspiring even today. Chapter 38, beginning verse 1, says, And the Lord answered Job by the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. You know, Job, you you don't know what you're talking about. You want to give me instructions? Fine. Give me instructions. The Lord asked Job questions regarding the order of the universe, which he previously commented on. And again, how would you explain these things? Job has no answer. Chapter 40, verse 4. Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. But the Lord's not done with Job. He asks another series of questions, focusing on God's justice and his moral rule on the earth. And would Job really challenge this? He's not just, you know, he's not the creator. He's part of the creation. How will he answer? And that's when we come to chapter 42, verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Job comes back like we would expect a righteous man to come back and says, you're right, God. I know you're in charge, and I know what you plan is going to come to fruition. 
And, and I know whatever you purpose, nobody can stop it. So if, if this is your will, it's your will, and, and, and it can't be done some other way. And you asked about the one who speaks when they really shouldn't speak and doesn't understand. Yes, I now understand that's me. I, I was trying to talk about some things that I really don't understand. Now, again, his friends didn't understand him either, but he doesn't throw them under the bus at this point. He just says, hey, you know, there were things that were too, they're too hard for me. They're too above me. I mean, I, I am just a person, and, and I'm the one that needs to listen to you. I don't need to be talking to you. I, you need to be talking to me. So now, please, you instruct me. I'll listen to you. I've heard of you, but now I see you, and, and I retract. I repent. I, I take my statement back. I don't have anything to challenge you with anymore. And then we see the Lord's compassion and mercy. The Lord does condemn the three friends. They had misrepresented God. They had falsely accused Job. And he tells the beginning of verse 7. It came about after the Lord had spoken these words to Job. The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves and my servant Job will pray for you. For I will accept him so that I may not do with you according to your folly because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite went and did as the Lord had told them and the Lord accepted Job. That's really kind of interesting talks to them and says, you guys have sinned in what you said about Job. I want you to take some animals to him and make an offering through him and have him pray for you. The guy that you were just saying was such a sinner and that's why all this happened. No, he's right. He'll pray for you. I'll forgive through him in this way. And then the Lord restores the fortunes of Job. Job chapter 42 beginning of verse 10. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. And all his brothers and all his sisters and all who had known him before came to him. And they ate bread with him in his house. And they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversities that the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him one piece of money and each a ring of gold. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys. He had seven sons and three daughters. Describes the names of his daughters. Says there was nobody like them before. And then in verse 16, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his grandsons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. He never gives an explanation. I mean, that's one of the things we can talk about in the sermon study, how we apply this. You know, what we do with this, but we see the Lord restored him. The Lord was gracious. The Lord forgave him for what his struggles were. The Lord blessed him. The Lord provided for him. And God causes all things to work together for good to those who love the Lord. To those who are called according to his purpose. I mean, that's how Job ends. And again, it's a struggle to get through the book. It's a struggle to get through all the arguments. It's a struggle to try to deal with that emotional turmoil that Job was feeling. But when Job finally turned to God and said, I don't have any answers you have the answers. I, I don't have anything that I can instruct you with. You need to instruct me. You, you don't need me. I need you. When he opened up to God in that way, then God blessed him and restored him. And I think there's a message there for us. I think even as it relates to the invitation, as it relates to bringing our lives, you know, as long as we still try to control our lives, we mess them up. As long as we seek the answers in ourselves, as long as we seek the answers in our culture, in our society, sometimes from our friends, from those who we think are wiser than us, it's never going to go anywhere. When we surrender to God and say, I don't have any answers, you have the answers. I don't know what to do with my life. You know what to do with my life. You do what you want to do with my life. I'm pulling back from this. You know, I'm going to put my hand over my mouth. I don't have anything to say. I retract. I repent. You do what you want to do. That's when we find the life. If we lose our life, we'll find it. If we give it to him, then he'll give us life more than we ever imagined before. And if that's where you are this morning, I'd encourage you to do that. If you're not a Christian, to become a Christian, that's part of why we extend the invitation. Someone who's never been baptized into Christ. You've never repented of your sins. You've never confessed your faith in Jesus. You're not a child of God. We want to help you do that this morning. But for those who are children of God, and maybe you've struggled like Job has, Maybe you've been angry. Maybe there's other things. Maybe there's some other way that, that we can help you. I want to encourage you. Turn to God. God's the one who can really help you. 
but sometimes he can use his children to help as well. As Job's family and friends, they came and they consoled him and they strengthened him and they comforted him. If we can help you in that in some way, please come forward let us know what we can do while together we stand and sing the song that's been selected. seated. Well, it's good to see everyone here this morning. We do have another reason for rejoicing this morning. Uh, Pastora, who visited with us, uh, I think last week, uh, she's here again today. Um, she's been spending some time here during the service talking with uh, the Miles. Uh, she does speak English. She's much better at Spanish. Uh, and so they've been having a lot of uh, discussion conversations in Spanish, and she has expressed a desire to be baptized into Christ this morning. So um, we will not have the sermon study. We'll be preparing for a baptism. Uh, Miles is going to go ahead and handle that. So he's going to come and, and receive her confession of faith. And then we will start preparing uh, everything for the baptism this morning, getting her changed, get Miles uh, changed and all of that. Um, maybe, Bryce, if you want to try to pick out a song or two that we can sing during that period of time, we, we hope that you'll be able to stick around and we'll have that done as, as soon as possible. Obviously, if you're not able to, we understand that. But uh, we're just going to go ahead and extend this through um, her baptism and uh, be able to rejoice together in that. We are so thankful for your presence. 
And uh, Miles, if you want to go ahead and get her confession of faith, and then we'll prepare for the baptism. 